<clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, thanks for the, coming along tonight and doing um, me speaking about Grey Tree's beer in these very difficult times. So, um, um, obviously, I'm really apologetic towards the way things have been. Obviously, the tap house has been closed and everybody's frustrated and everybody keeps saying to me about when the tap house is opening. So, um, we thought we'd do a live stream tonight. So, um, talking about different beers, okay? So, um, what I first thing I want to talk about is is the way we bottle our beer and that's the way as in bottle conditioned beer, okay? So, the modern style beers of today, um, there's two ways of bottling your beer. Some beers are filtered and carbonated by forced carbonation, and some beers are live beers in the bottle, okay? Bottle conditioned, right? There's very few breweries out there doing that now. Um, but going back in the day, it was very common, you know. And um, what what I have done myself is I've gone out and looked at some of the bottle conditioned beers on the shelf, okay? And I've tried to make our beers as good as them. Um, when we first started brewing, we did do some small bottle conditioning, um, which was a little bit um, not as good as it should have been, really. But um, another thing was we did send our beers away to be filtered and then carbonated, forced carbonated. So the, the problem was we were sending our beers away um, and they were getting sterile filtered. So, And then, um, obviously, um, with the steroid filtration, we were losing about, you know, 40, 50% of our flavor. So, you know, obviously we care a lot about a beer and we didn't want that to happen. And um, another thing, when you're bottling beer and you're sending it away, the biggest problem you have is a thing called dissolved oxygen, right? Dissolved oxygen, if oxygen gets into your beer, okay, it can really mess your beer up, okay? And we were having situations, we were selling our beer away, the bottle companies were measuring the DO or dissolved oxygen levels and the beers were coming back really badly, okay? So we weren't really happy. Some companies or some brewing companies would have said, oh, let it go, but we weren't in that position. We wanted our beer to be as good in in uh, the bottle as it was in the cask. So um, we tried different companies and we just weren't happy with um, the steroid filtration and the carbonation post carbonation so what we decided to do was start looking at doing larger scale bottle condition which we've done okay so what a bottle conditioned beer is okay is a bottled beer okay that's got live yeast and priming sugar in it okay so what we do is we ferment the beer as we normally would brew it ferment it and then what we would do then is get it as bright as we can in the tank we'd add priming sugar and yeast, mix the beer, okay, and then fill manually, okay? So what happens then is <clears throat> the priming sugar and the yeast would react in the bottle. There's a top on the bottle. The bottle then is put in a room at 20 degrees. The yeast and the sugar reacts together, and it causes fermentation, okay? Fermentation, as you know, most of you know, produces two things, CO2 and alcohol. At the fermentation, we bottle or bottle fermentation is only a tiny amount of alcohol that's produced but what it does do is produce quite a bit of co2 the co2 has got nowhere to go in the bottle okay once the oxygen in the top of the bottle has been eaten up by the secondary fermentation okay the co2 is trying to get out of the bottle and it can't get out so it's absorbed into the liquid okay and the skill of bottle conditioning in is getting the carbonation levels right so the priming solution's got to be right and your repitching yeast has got to be bang on, okay? And we've been experimenting for a long time on getting the right amount of carbonation or condition in the bottle, okay? The downside with bottle conditioning in, and that's why a lot of people go the other way like we did originally, was the yeast at the bottom, the bottle's been stacked incorrectly, and obviously the biggest problem is when you pour, you get the cloudy beer because the yeast hasn't been done properly. So that's the reason why we bottle condition, okay? We have done cans of beer where we haven't, you know, and we haven't had the success that we've had in the bottle condition. And I, and I feel it's still a real ale in the bottle because the yeast is still in the bottle, okay? And it's really important to us because 
you know, we, <clears throat> we've won lots of camera awards. And if you sterile filter and force carbonate the beer, it's not a real ale. This is a real ale in the bottle, okay? Because it's still a live beer, all right? So is there anybody out there would like any questions about bottle conditioning? Just, you know, fire away. Any questions? Anybody got any questions? Okay, we're going to crack on then, right? So the first beer I want to talk about tonight is the first beer we ever brewed at Grey Trees Brewery. And it was brewed in Flakeguide, home of Grey Trees. And it was originally called Recobites Bitter, okay? When we went to Abraham and we changed the name of it and we called it Craddog's Bitter, right? For me, any home brewer, any brewer in this country should start with the basics. Yeah, basic, good quality beer, okay? Here we go, Caradox Bitter, okay? There's so many brewers out there now, right, that want to make these vanilla stouts, porters with all these different flavours in, super duper RPI IPAs. But this is your belt and braces method, you know? This is a classic British bitter, okay? You should start, and my advice to any brewer out there, is to start with the basics using British malt and British hops, okay? So, um, obviously, when we first set up Great Trees, the plan was, was, was you know, we wanted to make a standard bitter because, you know, with whales, you know, we've always had brains. Obviously, we've had some really bad bitters in the past, like the keg bitters. And we've, uh, fortunately enough, you know, I think, you know, quite an iconic bitter for us would have been something like Brains, Brains Bitter or maybe some Berlin Vol beers going back in, you know, going back in the day. So we wanted to try and make something like a British bitter, okay? So um, what is a British bitter then? You know, how many of you know what a British bitter is? What is it, you know, is, what colour is it? What EBV is it? You know, what style is it, all right? So a bitter is a classic British beer that was brewed in the 1800s, okay? To me, should be 3.9% or lower. In the case of Brains, I think Brains is 3.6, 3.7, Brains bitter. Our Caradogs is 3.9, okay? Um, you know, it's a classic British style beer. Um, obviously, people with a with modern era today, People like to drink golden ales and they drink IPAs and they drink all this super duper beer that's about. And we, you know, we are big fans of them beers as well. But we like to make a solid bitter, you know, which is a Billy Basic beer. OK, so 3.9 percent amber copper coloured beer. You know, we use Maris Otter, Caragold, Crystal, a little bit of roasted barley and British hops. So we're looking at. Fuggles, Goldings, Challenger, all them kind of British hops to try and create a nice solid bitter. And to me, a bitter should be a copper amber colour with a very bitter dry finish, okay? Um, and I think we really have hit the nail on the head with Caradogs. It is, um, you know, you know, it's, neat. it's got a cracking name after, you know, Arbidae's most favourite, uh, famous son. And, um, you know, it, you know, with a lot of people, um, I've highly rated a lot of you know the modern style beer drinkers don't like it because of what it is because it's a bitter. And um, back in 2017, I think it was Caradoc's Bitter won champion bitter of Wales, which was a massive achievement for us because I always wanted one of our traditional beers to win an award, and to me, that's one of the best scouts we've ever had winning champion beer of Wales in the bitter category and also it's had some good great taste awards okay which is you know um, the great taste is a big organization and they ra rated um, our Caradogs as well so um, so any anyway, without any further ado we're going to open up the Caradogs and I'm going to show you how you open a bottle of <laughs> bottle conditioned beer right um, our good friend Brian Fibbin uh, done a, a bit of a 
thing on YouTube, on Facebook the other day, I'm showing how to open a bottle of conditioned beer. So um, here we go. Craddock's bit there. It's been in the fridge for about an hour, probably 12 degrees. No, I no. Do you want it too low? Do you want it too high? Okay. It's been sat flat uh, upright for a period of time. So we're going to open it up now and we're going to pour it. You're going to pour this into the traditional ale glass. Okay. Um, Reason being, it is traditional beer, so I'm going to put it into traditional Grey Trees Ale glass. So get your glasses at the ready. Okay, bottle upright. Um, just a little talk about the glass, right? This is an ale glass, okay? There's no widget in these glasses, okay? What you find when you pour lagers and you pour all these super duper beers, they have widgets on them to cause the the the, the the, the you know the the gas is it, it, you know it's um, it looks it looks is pretty much um, cosmetic. It is the the widgets in the glasses when you have a Carlin or a Strongbow or whatever and it's fizzing about you go oh look at that that looks good it's just purely cosmetic all right and I'll go into that later on in, when I when we pour some of the other beers okay so that's a traditional ale glass no widget you know it's the way it is so anyway. I'm going to open up the bottle of Carrad Dogs, okay? So I'm just going to listen for the S, okay? So the S is the CO2 trying to get out of the bottle, okay? It's a nice S, nice little bit of smoke coming out, okay? What you do want with a bottle conditioned beer is the beer frothing over, okay? So if there's any own brewers out there and you're bottle conditioning your beer, you do not want that to froth over and lift all the yeast off the bottom of the bottle, okay? So... Here we go. I'm going to tilt my glass, okay? Bottle. I'm going to start pouring nice and slowly. Okay, as you can see, it's creating a slight head. I'm going to look at the bottle, okay? And then if I think there's not enough condition, I'm going to lift the bottle a little bit higher and higher and higher. I'm going to look at the neck of the bottle. I'm going to leave the east just in the neck of the bottle there. Perfect. Not as good as Brian in this, but as you can see, the beer is perfectly bright. Okay. What you don't want in the beer is your yeast. There you go. There's your yeast. There's your beer. Okay. You do not want the yeast in the beer. If you do the pouring correctly, it's not a big problem. It's not going to make you ill. You know. Probably make it go to the toilet at least once a day, but um, there's a little bit of secondary fermentation in your stomach, but it's not going to do you any damage at all. All right, so that's pouring a bottle of conditioned beer. So <clears throat> back to the beer. Lovely white creamy head. Why do we have a white creamy head in Wales? Because people are used to having thick creamy heads in the in the beer. You go to other places in UK in different regions, they like to have a beer. With an head, you go to London, they don't want an head, they want to be a flat as dishwater. But you can go to places in Wales where people drink flat beer, you know. I'm a big fan of drinking beer on gravity, or on an pump, out of a bottle, whatever you want, right? It's, it's completely up to you, but don't get this thing in your head because it's a thick, creamy head on the beer. It makes it good, okay? A lot of the beers they make today, and nitrogenated, so there's loads of nitrogen in them, so it creates a big thick creamy head. This is a live beer in the bottle, and it's produced a nice thick creamy head purely down to the beer. Okay, so let's 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 talk about the actual beer itself. So let's start off with the aroma. So what I'm getting is uh, like a spicy herby. Floral flavour coming off it. <clears throat> um, no, um, just try again. Yeah, it's very floral. I get quite a bit of citrus notes coming off it. Ubi, um, mint, you know, um, quite traditional British bitter kind of flavours. Okay, um, little taste. Yeah, I'm finding it's, it's a very dry bit to finish. 
bit there. It's a nice rounded flavour in your mouth. Um, this beer is brewed with a lot of British hops. Um, I think it's Goldens and Challenger we use. Fuggles maybe. I, um, what you find with these beers, they tend to give you that herby, spicy, um, you know, dry flavours. But what this beer is, is a bitter and it's very dry. It's got a very dry finish in it, on it. And that's what we've tried to achieve with the Cradogs. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, it is a bitter. Um, there's a little thing, a trade secret here, that um, obviously since we've been going seven or eight years now, we try and keep developing our beers, okay? So what we've done is we've chucked a different op into the Corral Dogs from day one to try and get it a little bit more floral. Just an int, okay, and it's coming through quite nicely. It's got like a lot of floral uh, citrusy flavours, but such very, very, very slight, okay? Um, as for the colour, as I told you earlier, it's a bronze, copper, amber colour, if you want to call it that. But to me, that is a classic, classic British bitter. I check out the condition, so you just whisk it around in the glass. There you go, look. Bags and bags of condition. Um, another thing I want to speak about when you're talking about condition or the carbonation in the beer and the condition of the beer itself is <clears throat> um, when you carbonate beers through these big companies, they will tell you or they will ask you what carbonation levels you require in your beer, okay? so. For instance, if I sold diggers and I sold tender rain, it got filtered and carbonated. Sorry, this is quite gassy, it says, considering this bottle condition. Um, they will ask you how many volumes of CO2, okay? Now, obviously, this is a naturally carbonated beer. So the beers they will do, they will force carbonate, they'll force CO2 into a cold beer until it takes volumes of CO2. Now, this beer, I would probably say, is about two set, two volumes of CO2, okay? In a false or um, false carbonated beer, it'd be about 2.5 to 2.6. Now, when we keg our beers, if we ever keg some of them, which we do, okay, our mosaic in keg is 2.5 volumes of CO2. The difference between that and this is that this is mimicking the cask beer, okay? You're trying to make this beer as close as you can to a cask beer, probably a little bit more carbonation, okay, which it has, okay? Because if you were to drink a cask beer in, in the tap house, it would not have the same amount of carbonation levels. So approximately, we've measured our bottle condition beers and they are about two volumes, okay? So if you look at the... Obviously, the other beers that are being produced the other way, they are probably about 2.5. So you find them a lot more gassier to drink. So um, this is more towards the traditional side of what we're trying to achieve. OK, um, would anybody like to see if you can see nice small bubbles in the beer? Lovely colour and look how bright it is. It's crystal clear. Yeah. How many people have phoned me up and said, oh, Ray, your bottle condition beer is cloudy? Does that look cloudy to you? It's perfectly bright, okay? So, you know, um, would anybody like to ask any questions about Caradog's Bitter? Or Bitters in general, you know? I mean, they've been around a long time. I mean, Bitters were around in the 1800s and, you know, they they pretty much survived. If you look at, a, you know, some classic Bitters, like if you look at London Pride and you look at Young's, you know, they made Bitters. And if you look at you know, obviously Brains and Bellingwall and you know some of the big big breweries um, in Britain have made you know traditional bitters to a good standard. But the thing is, it's a style of beer that we lose losing our way with. I think uh, because everybody's moving towards gold nails and IPAs and this that the other. You know, a lot of brewers don't even make bitters anymore. It's like the miles, like the miles have gone. You know, classic British beers and. Um, 
if I go to any beer festival, people say, oh, do you want one of these IPAs or do you want this, do you want that? I don't care. I, I want to drink a bitter sometimes. Like Wai Valley, they make a good bitter. You know, and it's, you know, it's, you know, a bitter is a, is a classic British style. A lot of the younger lads don't like to drink them. But, um, you know, it's, it is what it is. Okay. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed drinking Caradox. You know the history of it. You know the style of it. And you know where you should be pouring it. All right. So I'll try and drink this before we move on to the next bottle. Yeah, lovely, clean, crisp. Okay, so I'm going to finish our one later. Any questions? Okay, then. So the next bottle we're going to try is going to be another traditional British style beer, which is Porter. Okay, so here we go. Valley Porter. Okay, so what is a Porter then? A stout door. Yeah, so, I mean, there's so many of you out there probably think, I know what a porter is. So, anyway, porter, again, was a beer brewed in the 1700s, like going back that long ago, one of the oldest styles of beer. And apparently, porters were the first beers to be brewed all over the world. Before IPAs, before lagers, before this, before that, porters is one of the oldest style beers you can drink, okay? So, what's the difference between a porter and a stout, then? Hmm, it's a difficult one, right? Modern era, they, there is very different, very little difference between a porter and a stout. I mean, in London years ago, porter was the cheapest beer you could drink. The London porters, dock workers, they would all drink porter, okay? And the story goes, would they mix different beers together to make a porter, okay? Um, it died to death, porter did, but it's made a bit of a comeback just recently, okay? Um, uh, obviously, V Day today, you know, it was obviously 75 years since the war. Um, with obviously uh, Ireland, they've always had a good name for Porters and Stout, but it was born in London, Porters and Stout. And the story goes was that when we were fighting uh, the Second World War um, and the First World War, during the First World War, the Republic of Ireland was a part of Britain, but the Second World War, they were free states. So, um, Apparently, all the malts we made um, were, was prioritised, okay? And the brewers in the UK weren't allowed to use all the malts they wanted to, to make porters and stouts. So that's why the Irish became so good at making stout, because the British were suppressed with the war, and the Irish was a free state, so they could do as much as they wanted and grow as much malt and whatever they wanted to do, because basically they just had to look after themselves. So. Um, that's one of the theories behind the Irish being good at making good stout and porter. Okay, so that's a little bit of an insight uh, to, to, to porters, okay? Um, originally, the porter we brewed, okay, was a contract brew that we brewed for a London brewery, okay? It's a little trade secret here, okay? And this beer won champion beer in london runner up okay we didn't even know about it it was a little thing we did i don't want to speak too much about it but i found out in the latter stages in like 1718 that this beer was actually a champion beer but we you know we didn't even know it you know but anyway um what did we call it we called it valley porter because obviously we're from the valleys and you know we wanted to make a porter so um, I thought, what a better name to call it than Valley Porter. Um, it's won a few CBA awards, which is Society of Independent Brewers, but it's also won Canberra Beer uh, Porter of Wales 2019, which is a massive achievement for us. Um, we went um, to um, Liverpool, sorry, it was in Liverpool, or Birmingham rather, for the Great Winter Beer Festival. It's the first time our port has ever appeared in the Winter Beer Festival camera. And it uh, didn't come anywhere, but it was just good that we got into the final, okay? So that's a little bit about port. Now let's open it up and let's have a look about it. Let's have a look what it's about. Okay, then, same scenario, 
12 degrees out of the fridge, upright, pop. Well, nice fizz there, okay? Nothing overflowing, so sounded good. The carbonation sounded good. Okay, so we're just going to go for the pour now. Just going to use a two-lip glass now because the other glass has got Caradogs in it. So I'm um, just going to go ahead with uh, pouring the pour down, okay? So same scenario, tilt the glass, tilt the bottle and start filling. Okay, just going to leave these to the bottom, and there we have it, a nice, silk, thick, creamy head, okay? Um, when we brew porter, okay, um, we've carbonated some of these beers at about um, two volumes of CO2, but this is slightly under because it needs to be, because the style of beer needs to have a lower carbonation level in it, okay? So, um, obviously, picking it up, it's really black, okay? Even though it's a bottle conditioned beer, you can't see the yeast. I've still left the yeast at the bottom of the bottle. So there you go. There's your yeast. Sorry, any questions coming through? Oh, yeah. oh right, sorry, we've fallen back. Sorry, yeah. Somebody asked for the name of Caradogs. Caradogs is, um, you know, Griffith. Reese Caradog Davis, uh, and he took the choir to London from Arbidae and he put Arbidae on the map. So that's where Caradog's come from. And there's actually a statue in Arbidae town. And um, the name came from, you know, Caradog himself. So, so I'm just, well, you know, we're just picking up on these um, these questions, all right? Um, anyway, use the, the, the porter. I'll answer a few more questions once they start to taste the beer, okay? So you can see there's a thick creamy egg. It's not as well carbonated as the other style of beer, but that's the way the style should be, okay? So anyway, let's have a smell. Oh. Okay, so what, you, what I'm picking up is coffee notes, roasted notes, like a black flavor, um, lovely roundness of, you know, completely different styles of beer, okay? Like an hazelnut, roasted, black malt. Hello, Brian. Terry, so let's dive in and have a taste. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting them coffee, roasted, black malt, quite dry, lovely flavour. You know, completely different to the Caradog. So my palate now is having a bit of a, ideally should have washed our palates, probably will do it after the next bottle. But um, a completely different style of beer there. Um, I think it's got so much character about it. And um, with this beer, this is probably the most complex malt recipe we do, okay? We use Marisotta, we use Crystal, we use eye color Crystal, we use rye Crystal, we use black malt, we use roasted barley. We even put oatmeal in it. We also put rye Crystal in it, which is quite a unique uh, kind of, um, uh, well, it's not actually malt, it's rye. So it's quite, you know, it's quite unique to put that into your beer. But I always remember speaking to a maltster once and he said to me, if you're going to make a stout to a port, and the more different flavor malts you can put in, the more character it's going to add to the beer. So there's quite a lot going on here. Um, and hop-wise, um, we use a classic British hop in here called Bramling Cross, okay? A Bramling Cross is um, it's up there with the Fraggles, the Goldings, the Challenger. And what you get with Bramling Cross is you get a black currantly flavour. And i got it coming through a very, such a very slight hint of it, okay? You get that red, like, blackberry flavour coming through. This beer, 4.6% ABV, okay? Um, a lot of porters, as you see on the market today now, can have vanilla, they can have 
marshmallow. You can have all sorts of things. And when this beer went to the London competition, uh, uh, sorry, the Birmingham competition for the Great Winter Camera Beer Festival, it was up against like porters of six point five percent. So um, it's good that we can infuse this flavour into a four point six percent beer. Really, um, you know, sometimes with the extra alcohol in a beer. And the extra, you know, just extra body gives you, you know, that extra flavour kind of thing. But for what it is, at a 4.6% porter, I think, you know, this beer beat um, the Tiny Rebel um, Stay Puff, which is, I'm a big fan of Stay Puff. It's a marshmallow porter. So, you know, if you put yourself in that position, if you were the judge and you were drinking a traditional porter, and a modern style porter, which has got marshmallow in it or raspberry, strawberries, and that's what everybody's doing. But they still went, the judges still went for this traditional porter, which is quite unique if you think about it, because you know, you know, the way the trends have gone, people you think people would have gone for the marshmallow stout rather than the traditional, um, sorry, the marshmallow porter rather than the traditional porter. But think, you know, fair on the judges. They've given that. And another thing with this is the drinkability of it. I could probably drink a lot more Valley Porter than I could drink a marshmallow or strawberry stout. So going back to tradition still works for me because, you know, I've gone to this tap house and oh, I've gone to pubs in the wintertime and drunk stouts and porters and I really, really enjoyed them. But then again, I've gone to places where I've had a strawberry stout or marshmallow stout and i've drunk it and i've got oh, that's stunning it's flavorsome it's amazing but you know what it's not sessionable you know so that is a sessionable porter that is the right gravity full bodied lots of roasted lots of chocolate lots of coffee flavor coming through and it's just uh, it's the nail on the head for me so any questions on the porter Yeah, just had a question. Can cold temperature affect the head? Um, well, yes, it does. I mean, cold temperature will affect the condition of the beer, okay? Um, we've bought a conditioned beer because it's live, okay? If you chill the beer too low, okay, you can call a thing called chillies, right? And it's the proteins in the beer, okay? And what happens is, is when you pour your beer, you'll see it's quite cloudy. And you do see it in pubs sometimes. And I told many landlords before mm -hmm. that, when you pour the beer, when you, you know, pull a beer through a beer engine, you don't put it through a remote cooler. You do not, you know, the beer, you should be able to put a probe in the beer and it should be 12 to 14 degrees. Now, you probably get away with 10, 8, maybe 6 degrees. But if the beer is any colder than 6 degrees, okay, then you're going to have a haze build up in it, okay? But what we do with our bottle condition, just for you people, we put an enzyme in that beer to make that beer clear as we physically can, even if it goes down to two or three degrees. I'm not guarantee it's going to be clear, but the enzyme is in there. So if there's people out there that want to drink um, cask and, uh, bottle conditioned beer at three or four degrees, you can, and we'll try and get it as clear as we can for you, okay? But um, ideally, you should be drinking at anything from 10 to 14 degrees, okay? Because what happens is it knocks the condition out of the beer and also the head will become flat and it pretty much, um, you know, the temperature will affect the beer massively. So, you know, for, for, for the sake of live beer, <laughs> serve it at the right temperature. Any other questions? I'm actually drinking this. Porter now, and because it's not so heavily carb well, so carbonated as much as the Caradox, you can drink a little bit more of it. It's got that lovely full bodied flavour. Was that Astrovelta? Hello, Astrovelta. Was that Chris? Is it? Is it Chris up there doing? How are you, Chris? Have you had our porter on lately? Beautiful drop, this is. Champion Porter of Wales 2019. Anybody got any questions on our Porter? Okay, then. 
Abby Evans, hello. Are you enjoying the porter tonight? Okay, yeah. Can I have some water? Is there any cream crackers? I just want to clean my palate for the next beer. Sorry, what I should have said is um, ideally, like when we go from beer to beer, we should cleanse our palates. So your, your palate is clear with a bit of cold water. And um, obviously, it gives you, you know, when you go from stylus to stylus, I picked these stylus in a row because I felt that they would work well together. But ideally, like, you know, when you're doing beer tasting, you need to wash your mouth, maybe a cream cracker, dry your mouth out, and then start again, okay? Um, what I like to do sometimes when I taste beer, especially in the brewery, we test our beer about 10 o'clock in the morning because that's when our palates are really sensitive. And um, not to sound like alcoholics or anything, but it is a really good thing to do is to taste your beer early in the morning when your palate's clean and you haven't got nothing on it. So, you know, what we try to do is mimic that now by washing our palates and um, and having a cream cracker, okay? So anyway, I'm going to finish this porter, if you don't mind. I hope you guys are doing okay. Any more questions? Any Irishmen want to talk about porter brewed in London? And another thing about the style as well with porters was um, when you made a strong stout, they used to call it a stout porter, okay? And um, what it meant was an amplified stout, like, but, I mean, you know, you get these Russian Imperial, and we brewed a Russian Imperial a stout once. Obviously, we haven't done it because it's a mainstream beer, and it was a bottle beer, but it's something we're going to be looking at doing now. And our Russian Imperial stout was 8%, and it was a lovely, like, same as the porter, roasted barley, crystal, uh, coffee notes coming through. It was beautiful, beautiful beer, branding cross. Um, but we haven't brewed it since, but there's something is food for thought now going forward, whether we're going to do another porter and maybe we'll do a, a Russian Imperial Stout or something. Um, obviously, the other, you know, the sister beer to this is the Black Road Stout, which was originally 4%. But um, obviously, the Black Road Stout... Um, was uh, you know still in production, still in bottle, still in cask, but um, you know very similar to US porters and stuff. So anyway, I'm going to polish this off. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, so um, cream cracker. Cleanse the palate. Nice glass of water. Obviously, water from the Brecon Beacons National Park. Very important part of the brewing process for us. Our water in great trees is very soft. Doesn't need much treating. Yeah. Okay, so... We've got another 20 minutes to go. We're aiming to finish for 8.58 so we can do a toast to the Queen, okay, on this V day. So um, make sure your palates are nice and clean, ready to go for the next beer. Okay, next beer is Digger's Gold. Okay, Digger's Gold, Gold Nails. Gold Nails didn't come around till 1980, and um, it's quite the new style of beer in Britain, okay? And um, one of the most iconic Gold Nails in this country, going back in the day, was Timothy Taylor Landlord. Um, it was brewed with Styrian Goldings from Eastern Europe, the hops. You give it that lovely, you know... Um, you know, the, the flavour of the Styrian Goldings was fantastic. And uh, going back in the day, Timothy Taylor was champion beer of Britain and he was a classic gold nail. <coughs> but things have moved on. And in the gold nail category, in any beer festival you go to, the gold nails now have moved on quite significantly. And for me, like, gold nail going back about 10 years ago would have been... HPA from, from White Valley, Erdford Pale Ale. 
but the modern styles of tales have moved forward and a lot of US ops have been brought into the gold nail categories, into the, uh, the gold nail beers. And rightly so, because to me, I like a gold nail to have lots of op aroma, lots of pungent op flavours. And um, when we first brewed uh, Digger's Gold, it was one of the original beers we brewed, which was Cradolt's Drummer and Digger's. Um, we wanted to make a beer similar to probably one of my favourite gold nails was Slopian Brewery. They make a beer called Oracle. And I wanted to make a gold nail that tasted and had the same aroma as Oracle because it's a fantastic beer and it's won loads of awards. And, you know, when you first start making beer, you want to make it, you know, you, you look to people and you just think, you know what, I really want to make a beer like Oracle and it's uh, fantastic. So try to find out what they put in there you know, trying to find what they were doing with it. So basically, it was just toying around with the idea of making a soap, you know, oracle. So um, a good friend of mine wanted me to name the, the gold nail diggers after his dog in the red cow, and that's what we did. So um, like I said, the gold nail is quite a new category. So when you see some of these old guys in the pub, they go, what's that beer drinking? Is it lager? No, it's golden. It's, it's a gold nail, you know? So it's quite unique, it's quite new, even though it's 1980-odd or 19, you know, going forward, you know, it's still quite a young style of beer, but it's massive, you know. If you ever want to win a category in a camera competition, you want to win the gold nail category, right? Unfortunately for us, what got us on the map for Green Trees was in 2015, we won champion gold nail of Wales, which was a massive thing for us. Because we had Celt experience, we had Tiny Rebel, we had all these different breweries in Wales making these soppy beers, and we nailed Digger's Gold in 2015. Okay, this beer has been champion gold ale of Wales for five years constantly, okay? And that is an achievement in itself for me, okay? Um, it's also been silver champion beer of Britain in the gold nail category, and that was in 2018, which was another massive achievement. Um, it's qualified for Champion Beer of Britain for the last five years, okay, but not really come anywhere. But you're up against the Oakham Citrus, you're up against, you know, some really well, the Slopian Oracles. This beer has performed so well over the years for us, but, you know, um, unfortunately, it hasn't really done well as we'd like it to do in GVBF. Okay, so anyway, it's a golden ale. We're going to talk about it. Yeah, um, yeah, just um, chatting to the wife there. Um, we bitter this beer, right, at 25 to 30 bittering units. And what we find with some of the hoppy beers out there, okay, like especially Oakham, because you're up against them every, every year, and, uh, you know, for us to be even like talked about in the same category as Order Oakham is quite unique. So anyway, this beer is brew is bought is um, brewed to about thirty IBUs, bittering units. Okay, what I find with Oakham is it's got a lovely hop flavour, but it's very bitter. The beer is bitter, like heavily bittered with bittering hops, and I don't find it soft enough for me. So a Slopian or a Diggers. Would would suit me down to the ground. So anyway, let's uh, let's let's put it to the test. As you can see, on the side of the bottle, it says there, Champion Beer of Wales, fifteen to nineteen. That has a massive achievement. Okay, wait till you taste the mosaic next week. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Anybody out there want to tell me what their favourite uh, gold nail is? Nice fizz. Here we go again. Okay, lovely crystal clear beer. Glass, tilt, bottle, tilt, pour. Keep it pouring, keep it pouring. Keep these to the neck of the bottle. There we go. What's the 
No work. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So there we go. Poor. You can even see me through the glass. Perfectly bright. Okay. Just for demonstration. There's the east. There it is. Where it belongs. There's your lovely gold nail. Okay, so um, gold nails pretty much come around in 1980. Obviously, they've developed now. And I was just saying about HPA, uh, Erifer Pale from Y Valley, um, moved on again from Timmy Taylor to HPA to this, you know, to what Diggers is and what um, Oakham is and what Slope and Oracle is. Um, so, you know, the beers have moved on, and I, I don't know where the next step is, really. Um, so um, let's have a little sniff. Let's have a little look at it. Oh, my God. So what am I picking up there? I'm just picking up, like, lots of blueberry, citrusy, you know, like pretty, pretty much American hop flavor. Um, I'm not going to tell you what hop we're using here. Because it's a trade secret, okay. But um, it, you know, if you drink beer regular, especially pale ales, you'll understand um, the idea. But it, but the thing is, is you know, um, modern style gold nails are so potent and so flavoursome. You know, the people love to drink, you know, the these kind of beers, and I can understand why bitters have been pushed aside. But you know, as I said earlier, like this styles of beer out there. They they are meant to what they're meant to be. And sometimes I drink gold nails sometimes and they haven't got this kind of flavour behind them and I get disappointed because I'm expecting this kind of floral it and aroma it. So anyway, um let's have, let's have a let's have a little taste. Wow. Oh my goodness. So what you're getting is that blueberry, mango, all these tropical fruit flavors coming through. <sighs> Lovely and refreshing. Um, glad, glad I, we, you know, we cleansed our palates because uh, we needed to, to to drink that. And I'm glad this is the last beer we've tasted. So, um, any questions on Diggers Gold? Oh, somebody's asking what a bittering unit is. Okay, so when we make beer, okay. Um, the beer can be bitter at a certain level, so it means that when you drink it, you'll have that dry, bitter flavour, okay? Um, and that's purely down to the hop, the early hops we use. So the, the, when we get to um, 100 degrees, when the beer's climbing up and it's getting into the boil, okay, we add bittering hops, okay? And the amount of bittering hops you use will, will, will pretty much say what your bittering units are. And a lot of British beers can be from, like, for, for instance, our port is about 50, 20 bittering units. And then Diggers is 30, Afghan is 50. So different, you know, some people will make 100 bittering units, like for Oakham Citra, like I think that's probably up in the 60s or 70s, the bittering units, because it's very bitter and dry. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic beer. But for me, sometimes the bitterness is too much. And at grey trees, our bittering levels are, you know, no overly bitter. You know, the, the, the Afghan is the highest, you know, bittering because it's competing with the alcohol content and it's all this. Other. But that's what a bittering unit is, is, is pretty much the level of bitterness you put in that beer through the bittering ops early on in the boil. Okay, so that's the, the question answered. Um, anybody else got any questions? Okay, so um, yeah, um, gold nail. Uh, you know, there's so many people winning making golden beers now. Um, you know, you go in all these competitions, especially you know, you've got SA gold, you've got Gawa gold, you've got Mumbles gold, you've got you know, you've got Bradley Tuckloyd on in Pontypridd, and. You know, something that we should never forget is that the pioneers in Wales for brewing were Otley Brewing Company, and uh, they made a beer called Otley 01. And in 2008, Otley 01, they used American hops in it, 
And that beer won champion going beer of, of Britain in 2008. So, you know, when we look at um, Otley Brewing Company going back in the day, you know, 2008, champion going ale of Britain was a massive scalp for Otley in them days. But what they did was they, they, they did actually pioneer um, a lot of the brewing that was going on in Wales at the time. And, you know, Otley won loads of awards. And I don't think we would have been here today if it wasn't for Otley Brewing Company. And um, especially, the, you know, the pioneering, that they pioneered, um, you know, um, challenging themselves to make different styles of beer. And especially with all when winning the 2008 Champion Beer of Britain with all the American ops there, didn't it? So, is Golden uh, Ale and IPA the same? No. Um, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> You should be asking camera that, not me, really. <laughs> Try and sort their categories out. Golden Ale and IPA is obviously very similar, like a port and a, porter and a stout, but an IPA is an Indian pale ale, okay? And we make our Indian pale ale with a slight colour. So it's got a slight bronze colour on it, right? And it's very traditional, our Afghan pale ale, compared to Digger's Gold, okay? And the ABV is a big part of you know, the difference between the styles, okay? So a gold nail can be anything from 4 to 4.4, 4.5 or whatever. And an IPA should be, you know, originally 88% ABV. But uh, obviously that's not, you know, you can't drink that beer and it's not sessionable in the pubs. But an IPA should be, like, you know, strong. But we made our Afghan pale ale at 5.4. So there's a little bit of difference. And I think the colour as well of an IPA should have a bit more bronzer colour, like a bass, like a draft bass colour, like a traditional pale ale, but obviously a bit stronger. Yeah, so um, it is a big difference between a gold nail and, and, and um, an IPA in my view, you know. Um, any other questions? Anyway. Oh, any new beers on the way after lockdown? Yeah, we've been, we've actually got the old grey trees plant um, from um, the early days. So I done a double IP and that the other day. Um, I don't know how it's going to turn out, but um, I'm sure you'll have the, you know, um, we may run it in the tap house to see how it goes. Because, you know, the thing is, the craft room, we're always like trying to, um, trying to, you know, bring our beers up to, you know, better. You know, it's all about getting your beers to where you want them to be. Like, and no matter how good your beer is, you always want it to get better because the old saying goes, "You're only as good as your next pint." And um, sometimes um, we want our beers to be like competing to the next level. So, like, it's almost like um, if you make a gold nail and somebody beats you, so what are you going to do to make you? you'd be a beat that next beer. At the end of the day, sometimes you've got to stick with the recipe you've got because people love it for what it is. Weizen. Oh, yeah. Um, another question just came in. A Weizen for October. Uh, we did actually do a rice beer called Jäger Weizen. And we brewed that. Uh, what? Oh, sorry. Um, a Jäger Weizen we brewed going back in 15, 16. Very successful. We've done it in cask and bottle. And, uh, yeah, it was a great beer. But we are looking at doing an October fest if the restrictions uh, um, allow us to. We are looking at doing an October fest, okay? So it'll be lots of lager beer, lots of vice beer, you know, all different styles um, in the tap house in October, at the end of October. Um, you know, but um, I'm a big fan of ice beer and um, I want to try and make a uh, Jaeger Weizen again, um, you know, permitting, you know, with uh, obviously the coronavirus. Um, any other questions? On, this is Gold Nail. Mind, do you want to, anybody want to speak about Gold Nail? From Portugal. 
All right, somebody just come online and said uh, they drank an IPA, a gold nail in Lisbon that was 8%. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, the perimeters say what a beer style should be. And I'm, I'm certainly not a person that should be saying that, you know, you could make different beers a different. It's just bitters, best bitters, gold nails, IPAs should be brewed at that. If people want to brew right a level, that's fine. I mean, we make we used to make a Welsh extra special bitter. So, you know, the best bitter is like 4.2 to 4.6, 47, 48. And then if you go above that, it becomes, a you know, a special bitter. Like. So, you know, it's not to say that could be a special gold nail, you know. But um, this is where different styles um, obviously interact with each other. You know, they overlap each other. So... You know, it's not for me to say whether a gold nail at eight percent is an IPA or a gold nail, because it's you know it's it, you know gold, gold nail shouldn't be eight percent, but they made it eight percent. So you know, who am I to say? You know, my favorite gold nail. Somebody just came in and asked me my favorite gold nail is, but I've got to be honest, right? I like all the carbonated. Um, you know, I like the punk IPAs, I like the dead pony clubs. I like the, you know, there's so many lovely gold nails out there. But cast gold nail for me has got to be Salopian Oracle, you know, and that's what we base this beer on. And I, I you know, I know the, the, the Salopian guys really well. And, you know, I drank Salopian Oracle for many years uh, in the Red Cow and it was a go-to beer for me. Um, but the, the biggest achievement this beer has ever done is to beat Salopian Oracle in GBBF going back in 2016, was it? And uh, it, to me, like to try and make a beer and then beat them in the British Festival is massive. They, you know, it's, to me, it's the best brewery in Britain. And, um, you know, um, it's something we inspire to be. Like You, you look at these breweries. And you think, you know, you want to be like a... What's our achievements for all Grey Trees beer? Yeah. Okay, well, time's moving on now. So I'd thank, like to thank everybody for viewing us tonight, um, especially on VE Day as well. So, um, yeah, what time we got, love? Yeah. 8.59. So um, I'd like everybody to raise their glasses and we'd like to make a toast for the Queen. Has everybody got their glasses charged? Ladies and gentlemen, the Queen. Thanks for viewing. I hope you enjoyed. Take care, stay set, stay away from everybody and enjoy your beer. Look out for next Friday because we've got some other new styles of beers we want to talk about and um, look forward to seeing you all. Please subscribe to, to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. I'll practice a bit better next week. Yachida!